We're going to dive into the Word today. Uh, We're going to be all over a little bit, uh, everywhere, so if you want to just grab one of those Bibles close by, uh, or yours if you brought it with you, uh, that'd be great. Uh, We're going to start uh, by by talking uh, in Genesis 1, and so uh, you can just open up the front cover and then flip like two or three pages and you'll be there. Um, And... uh, but, uh, you know, I wanted to, I wanted to, I was thinking, uh, what message do you give uh, to uh, a church on a two-year anniversary and, and those kinds of things? Because, um, honestly, it was not really, um, I mean, we had this day planned, but, you know, it's kind of a, like, preach whatever you want, you know, not a part of a series, you know, kind of thing, and uh, so... Uh, but there's been uh, just, I feel like God has been showing me some things and speaking to me in some ways as of late that um, I think have been just profound uh, in my own life. And, uh, and, I, and I just want to share some of that with you uh, because I, cause I think hopefully maybe it will speak profoundly to you as well. And, um, and I, uh, I think... Uh, the best sermons, in my opinion, I'm not saying this is going to be one of them, uh, but, <laughs> but the best sermons are the ones that come from your heart and from what God is doing in your life, uh, not necessarily the best study um, and uh, the most uh, like knowledge, uh, if, if, for lack of a better term. And so, uh, so that's what we're going we're gonna to dive into today. So Genesis 1 and uh, I love uh, Genesis 1, I, but I think Genesis 1 is, is vastly misunderstood. If you come to our church, you hear me reference Genesis 1 a lot, uh, because for me, uh, you, you won't be able to really understand the whole story if you don't understand how the story begins. And a lot of people look at Genesis 1, and they think of Genesis 1 as this history or this account of how God created the world. And, um, and, it's, and it's great, and it's, and it's awesome, and there's nothing wrong with that, um, but, but from the very outset, I think the writer of Genesis is trying to get you to enter into something deeper. He's trying to get you to enter into a story. He says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and when he says that, um, is that my mic? Okay. It's broken. All right. Um, it, in, is he, the enemy is already trying to keep you guys from hearing what I'm saying. Um, so in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And that in the beginning, what it means is way back when. Or once upon a time. Are you doing... I'm just... <laughs> it must be my head. Like when I turn my head. Um, just keep it on standby. All right. <laughs> All right. I love it. He's, he's going to get me something in case I need it. Um, so, so it means way back when or once upon a time, which is a, which is a sign that, hey, this is a story. That I'm not, I'm not giving a history lesson, but I'm telling a story. And I'm not talking about how... The universe and the globe were created, but I'm talking about something, something else. And in verse 2, you get, and the earth was formless and empty, and there was darkness over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And verse 2, that that phrase, uh, formless and empty, and you, some of your translations may say formless and void, um, is, the, is one Hebrew word, tovu vavohu, okay? Uh, it's my favorite Hebrew word because I just like saying it, <laughs> tovu vavohu. But it just means wild and waste, wild and waste. And then it says that darkness, darkness in the scriptures represents this idea of evil or danger uh, at every turn. And so darkness is over the face of the deep, which is the waters, and the Spirit of God is, is hovering right there. Here's, here's what the writer of Genesis 1 is trying to get you to understand about this story. 
is that uh, this story is about uh, the fact that like the, 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 the idea of wild and waste, if you, if, you, if you even think about the culture and the context of which the, the Hebrew writer would have had to write this, um, he, he's, he's largely engaging with a landscape that is desert or wilderness. And I don't know if you guys have ever tried to live in the desert or the wilderness, but you can't do it, okay? Not without having to leave the desert and the wilderness to come back to civilization to get some water or you will die, okay? So, so that's kind of the idea here. So, so wild and waste is like a description of like this desert wasteland where, where you are not meant to live. The other place that you're not meant to live is in the deep. Like, you aren't meant to live in the deep. You can't live in the deep. You can float on a boat on top of the deep, but you can't live in the deep. You know what I'm saying? Like, you're not meant to live there. And the picture that the writer of Genesis 1 is trying to help you understand is this is a story about how God, he he takes this wild waste, chaos that you and I aren't meant for, that you and I aren't designed for, And with a whisper, day after day, he begins to bend that chaos to his will. And he is right there the whole time, just hovering right there the whole time. And so he goes through and he tells a story of how God creates beauty and order and structure out of this chaos. And then it comes to day six, and he creates you and me in his image. Because now he's created a world where you and I can live and flourish. But not just flourish, but we can create and rule. See, there's something about Genesis 1 that says God is in control of it all. And yet he offers us the opportunity to be creative and take care of and take charge of this beautiful world he's created. And so that's the job that you and I are given is to take this beautiful, good, very good world that God has created and look like God, be creators ourselves, be his image bearers, rule and reign, have dominion, and, and, and be in charge of to make this world a more Eden like place. But there's always the aspect of chaos and there's always an aspect of darkness and there's always an aspect of war actually you know i I recently heard john eldridge talk about the idea of war Um, he said that war wars end in one of three ways okay Uh, the first way wars end is an army runs out of resources Right, so so their resources are deplenished, and so they don't have the resources to stay in the fight uh, to keep the the fight going. Then he 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 points out that uh, the another way is uh, that that they will um, they will just lose heart, like an army will just lose heart. They'll just they'll just like man, this is just too much. It's one day after another of brutal war, day after day, battling and battling and battling, and I just can't take it anymore. And so I wave the white flag, and I get out of the fight. And then the last way to end a war is just pure annihilation. And what most of us forget or fail to realize is that we are created in the midst of a world And we're called to rule and have dominion and be creative and and bear the image of God. But from the very, very beginning, we are placed in the midst of a story that is a war of annihilation. And our enemy would really like us, he would really like us to lose heart. See, the enemy, he he knows he he is not going to be able to take away God's resources. He knows that God will never run out of resources. 
In fact, he even knows he can't even annihilate God, and he's not even going to win. So the only way that he has a chance to gain any ground whatsoever is to go after the soldiers in God's army to get them to lose heart and, and wave the white flag, to get out of the fight. But this is a war of annihilation and where the enemy is going to be wiped out. The question is, is are we going to be in the fight? Or are we going to lose heart? Are we going to stay in it, continuing to do what God's called us to do? Or are we going to lose heart? And... Um, because it's, it's not easy, right? I mean, you guys have all lived long enough to know that like, this is a really difficult fight, right? And this is a really difficult world, that, it, that there is chaos, and it feels unstable. And in the midst of that, uh, we can go a couple different directions. And one is, uh, is in the direction of Lot's wife. Now, let me explain what I mean by this, okay? Jesus, in Luke chapter 17, it's, it's crazy. Uh, I, it, it's a really, really interesting uh, part of, um, of, of the Gospels for me because I think it, it's these little tiny verses that just stand out. But in Luke 17, you can follow along there, verse 32. If you flip over there, you're going to see, and God is, uh, Jesus is talking about the coming of the kingdom of God. He's talking about kind of like what's going to start happening um, at the end and, and so forth and so on when things get a little bit unstable and things get a little bit chaotic. And, and he says, he says in verse 32, he says, remember Lot's wife. Just out of nowhere. Like he's just, he's going along talking. He says, remember Lot's wife. And I don't know about you, but when you hear something like that, you should go, why did he say that in the middle of what he was talking? Why did he say, remember Lot's wife? Well, if you don't know the story, Lot and his wife and their daughters live in Sodom and Gomorrah. This is Genesis chapter 19. And God sends two angels to them and says, you guys need to get out of the city. God's coming, and he's going to wreak havoc on the city. You need to get out, and you need to get out fast. So turn for the hills, and uh, don't turn back. Don't look back. And so Lot and his family, they take some convincing, but they eventually turn, and they take off uh, to go into this unknown place, into this place that, like, they, they honestly, they, they don't really know what's about to happen God said, you need to go do this. And they're like, ah, oh, it, it doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel comfortable. It feels very unstable. It feels very unpredictable. They, they are in this place of where they just don't know. And Lot's wife, as they're leaving, she turns around to look at Sodom and Gomorrah. And she turns into a pillar of salt. Now, what does that mean for us? How does that, how does that work in our life? Well, Jesus supplies it, and he says, uh, remember Lot's wife. Whoever tries to keep their life will lose it, and whoever loses their life will preserve it. And the idea of Lot's wife is that we lose focus on where God has called us to go and what God has called us to do because it feels unstable, and it feels uneasy, and it feels like I don't really know what's happening here, and we turn around to think of the good old days. We turn around and start trying to, like, but, but can I just go back? Can I just go back to this place when things were safe and I felt good and I knew it was going to happen tomorrow and I knew where I was going to get my next meal and all of these other kinds of things. You get what I'm saying? It's the idea of losing focus and not trusting that God is in control. You just need to do your job. And turning around and going, no, 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 I, don't, I just, I can't trust to take one more step. See, I don't know about you, but over the last couple years, man, mm, like Lake Springs Church was birthed in what I would consider a, a season of chaos. <laughs> it, it was birthed out of this like kind of chaotic and and really unpredictable 
situation. I mean, we, we literally, we were like, hey, we're going to start a church. We have zero dollars to do this. We have zero dollars to pay staff. We have zero dollars to pay utilities. We have zero dollars to do anything that we are getting ready to do, but we're going to do it. And it was crazy scary. And, it, and since, I mean, we got started, man, that war has been waging. They've been, like, the enemy has been coming strong and been coming hard, trying to just get us to lose heart, to get us to give up the fight. And there have been some times, man, especially in the last year, where I've stopped and I've turned around and I've gone, man, can we just go back? Can we just go back? <laughs> when things were easy and when things were stable and things were... <laughs> but we can't. Because God's calling us forward into something else. And I don't know about you, but maybe there's something in your life like that. Maybe there's something in your life where like you feel like it, right now, right? I mean, I was, just, I was told a story this morning about what's going on in Israel today, right? And you feel the chaos and you feel the unstable nature of what's happening in our world and you feel the unstable nature of what's happening in your own life and you want to go back. I'm telling you, you can't. God's calling you forward. But you're going to have to trust him, that he's in control, and that he has given you everything that you need for this moment in time. That he's, that he's created you and prepared you for such a time as this right now to make this world a more Eden-like place. We just have to do that job and trust him. But there's another interesting thing that happens when we feel this chaos, when we feel this instability. And, um, and it is referenced in, um, in Hebrews chapter 12. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's the godlessness of Esau. Have you all ever heard that before? The godlessness of Esau. Can you believe it? What, did, what, did he, what, what was so bad that Esau did? What? Well, what was that dude up to? Well, um, well, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 16, the writer of Hebrews says, See that no one, that means make sure nobody, is sexually immoral. We all screwed that one up, right? Okay, I'm glad you're all with me on that one. All right. <clears throat> or is godless like Esau... And you want to know the godless thing he did? Here you go. Who for a single meal sold his inheritance for the rights as the oldest son. That's the godlessness of Esau. He sold his rights, his inheritance, for a momentary pleasure. And when things start to feel chaotic and when things start to feel crazy and when things start to feel unstable and, oh man, like, the enemy will deceive and he will just put a bowl of soup in front of you. And say, why don't you give up your inheritance and just enjoy this right now? Just take your eyes off of the inheritance for just a second. Because it ain't coming for a long time. Just enjoy yourself right now. And man, have there been times over the last year or so that... I have ran to the golf course when I should have been writing a sermon. Or I should have been going to the hospital to visit somebody. Man, there's so many things. And they're not bad things. 
But man, they get dangled in front of us and it's like, oh, I gotta have it and I gotta have it now. And we lose sight. We lose sight of what's ahead. We lose sight of the future inheritance that we've been adopted into by the blood of Jesus. And we take for ourselves what we can get right now and we forget. No, no, no. We have a higher call and we have a higher purpose and we have a a, a greater inheritance to look forward to in the end. And we give ourselves over to just these momentary pleasures. These momentary moments of joy because we just can't handle how chaotic and unstable everything feels. We just need some relief. And maybe you experience that in your own life. And maybe that's why you keep running to a bottle or keep running to a drug or keep running to sex or porn because you just need some relief because the enemy is waging war against your heart and you're losing heart fast and you're ready to give up and you forget There's something greater waiting for you. If you'll just take heart and know he's overcome the world, that he's overcome the enemy, that he's overcome it all, if you could just take heart and stay in the fight and keep going. Here's the thing. You know, I would love to be able to stand up here two years into our church and say, I know exactly where Lake Springs is going. I have no idea. And for me to stand up here and say that I do would be arrogance. Because I'm not in control. All I'm trying to do is take care of and be creative. And with whatever sense of authority he gives me, rule well to make this world and this city, to make Holly Springs like it is in heaven. And so I have no idea what that looks like. I have some ideas in my head. I have some dreams. I have some visions. I have some thoughts on how we can do that and how we can accomplish it. And we'll, we'll try. We'll do anything we can to make Holly Springs as it is in heaven. We'll do everything we can to be a remnant, a creative, nonviolent counterculture to the world that loves people well, but that holds fast to the truth that we find in the scriptures. We'll, we'll give it our best shot, but I have no idea what that will mean two years from now or five years from now. All I know is that's where we're headed. We're headed into the unknown, but I'm okay with that. I'm not gonna try and look back, try and recapture some sort of glory days. I'm not going to try and go after momentary pleasures and sacrifice the inheritance God has for us. So I'm going to try not to. We all make mistakes. <laughs> Praise God, there's grace for us all. But here's the, here's the, here's the real thing, Right? Jesus talks about finding your life by losing it. And in in Hebrews 12, we hear about Esau who who will, he fails to, uh, he fails to give up his momentary pleasure to find the inheritance that God had for him. 
But you know the thing that makes Jesus different and the thing that we're all, all should be hoping for and striving for in our own life. The thing that makes Jesus different is that we know, we know that he did not consider equality with God as something to be grasped, but instead he took on the very nature of a servant. And being found in, in the image of a man, he took the cross and he scorned its shame. For the joy set before him, which were you and me, and he, and he gave up his life. No one took it from him. No one took him out. He gave it up freely for you and for me. And for us, we have to be willing to give it up freely. We have to be willing to get to this place of where we say, you know what? I'm not going to turn around and try and grasp for life. I'm not going to give it up for, for momentary pleasures, trying to get a little small piece of life. No, no, no. Life is found when I lay mine down. Life is found when I give mine up for the sake of others. That's what makes us like Jesus. That's what it means to do what Jesus did. It means to love God and do his will. It means to love others and lay your life down for them. I don't know what the future holds, but I know we're going to do that as best as we can. And when we fail and when we make a mistake, when we drift, we're going to try and get our eyes fixed back on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, and run the race that he has marked out for us. And I hope and I pray that you guys, you guys will all want to go on that journey together wherever it leads no matter how hard or how difficult it might seem but that we will do it together let's pray God thank you for today and thank you for just the chance that we have to be here in this place oh, thank you for just the way in which you have just shown us your sovereignty your control over it all. Thank you that in the midst of the chaos and the, the war that wages against our hearts, God, you're right there in the midst of it and you're not threatened by it. It doesn't scare you. God, when we fear, may we remember that you have overcome. That we can trust you that you can do immeasurably more than we could ever think, dream, or imagine. God, help us to see. Help us to see what it means to lay down our life to keep moving forward with you. To sacrifice our, our desires. to regain what was lost, to regain a past reality. God, help us to lay down our lives in the present moments when things are right there and very enticing that we want to take hold of, that we want to grab a hold of, that we want to, that we want to just cling to just for some relief. God, help us to see that we are in a world that is at war. And our enemy wants us to give up, to wave the white flag. Help us to rely on your spirit to empower us. For we have not been given a spirit of fear 
but of love and self-discipline. Let us stay focused, our eyes fixed on Jesus. who loved us to the very end and gives us an inheritance and a future glory with him forever.